All right, hello everybody. Thank you all for waiting patiently as we got things started up. Uh, my name is Jimmy Hicks and we are the Legacy City Planners. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming out this afternoon to the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs. Um, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. If you have cell phones, please make sure they're uh, muted at this time. Nobody wants to do the embarrassing shuffle to shut it off. Um, we also just like to thank our professors, uh, Tom Hildy and Professor uh, Jim Costellic uh, for all their hard work and dedication leading us in this endeavor. Um, it's my honor right now to introduce uh, the Dean of this college uh, of urban affairs, Dean Roland Angle. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Appreciate it. Also want to greet and welcome the elected officials that are probably on the Zoom call. It's just kind of strange to do that, but <laughs> I'll do that in any case. Want to welcome, is that one of our graduates over there, Chris? <laughs> it is, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah. I was at the event the other day, Chris. Thank you. Anyway, I'm here to welcome you. Uh, welcome uh, the Capstone students and their teachers. Um, you know, Capstone presentations are an important closing ritual, rituals for planning students. The presentations are the culmination of many weeks of talking with your clients or clients, assessing their needs, composing a project plan with your colleagues, doing the research, late night meetings, and also most important, discovering that some of your colleagues have different visions of time management than you do. <laughs> yes, preparing your capstone project can be vexing, but the learning and camaraderie will last a lifetime. So learn the lessons because they will take you far in your chosen profession. Remember the lessons again from this process. And to all of you, my sincere congratulations and best wishes. I look forward to learning a great deal from this great project. So I'm gonna sit down and uh, listen. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Hildy. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at the Levin College. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Capstone Planning Studio final presentation. Um, first, um, actually, I think the Dean actually really uh, sort of situated us very well in terms of how this course fits within the broader Master of Urban Planning and Development degree. Um, we have collaborative teamwork, we have working for a client, um, we have real feelings of pressure and um, getting a project across the finish line. Um, so it's a really special, important class. Um, this semester, our class client was the city of Lorraine. Um, do we have any city of Lorraine people here in the room? Yes, thank you. And I know we have several people from the city of Lorraine on Zoom. So um, I just wanna thank the many people um, that engaged with the class this semester, including Hannah Corrali, uh, Mayor Jack Bradley, who are both on Zoom, uh, former Lorraine employee Drew Crawford, who's here in person, um, and the many stakeholders who generously provided their time and expertise for us this semester. Um, and finally, thanks to Kirby Dade, who is on Zoom, uh, for uh, helping us out with the market analysis component of this project. Um, and then last but not least, I need to thank the students who have done a tremendous job. They're calling themselves the Legacy City Planners. Um, this has been a tremendous effort um, and dedication to bring this project to completion. Um, it's been really awe-inspiring for me to see everything come together over the last month. Um, and this is a small group, so they've done a huge amount of, of work. Um, and this is, this is a time where I feel that burnout is probably at its highest, maybe all-time high. And these students have persevered. They've been incredibly dedicated. They stuck with it, not just finishing this project, but getting done with their degree. Most of these students are graduating very soon. So um, it's a big accomplishment. Congratulations to you all. It's been a privilege to, to be your instructor. So thank you. One final note, this is a hybrid presentation. So we have many people on Zoom. We're gonna do the best we can with our technology today, um, but we appreciate your patience if we run into any hiccups. We will have Q&A at the end. So please hold your questions till the end. If you're on Zoom, feel free to type them into the chat box and we will address them when the students are done. And so at this time, I will hand it over to my co-instructor, fearless leader, Jim Stelic. 
capability. Well, this is the 20th capstone project that I've uh, been able to work on and I've really enjoyed all of them. Uh, and like previous projects, this project has an interesting mix of challenges and opportunities. There are over 2,200 cities and villages in the state of Ohio. A few of those communities have riverfront water, river fronts and that are publicly accessible, and even fewer have direct access to Lake Erie. The city of Lorraine is fortunate to be a community that has access to both. With this in mind, the city, which by definition is classified as a legacy city, hence the legacy city planners here, uh, asked our capstone class to research and design strategies for connectivity options between nearby low and moderate income neighborhoods with downtown and the Black River waterfront. The class is also tasked with recommending ideas for improving the Broadway Avenue corridor and determining potential options for use of city-owned uh, pellet terminal riverfront property, as well as the current city hall site. In the first half of the semester, the students heard from several guest speakers who shared their knowledge and expertise with them uh, about components of the project. During this phase, the students also com compiled questions for a potential survey and identified several stakeholders who would inter be interviewed for the project. The second phase requires significant collaboration amongst the students, both as a class and individual subgroups. <clears throat> the students were led by a steering committee comprised of Jimmy Hicks and uh, Catherine Preby, and they did a terrific job. And the class preferred, uh, they actually uh, prepared a number of project, project products, including market analyses, design drawings, and plan recommendations for the area. In addition to their plan, the students completed several other tasks, including developing graphics and maps, formulating a final report, preparing a summary presentation, which you're about to hear, making all the arrangements for this virtual and in-house presentation, and constructing a website for the project, which should be activated in the very near future. They pulled all this together in the last eight weeks, and we're very proud of all the work they've done. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jimmy. Stella and so, uh, please strap your seatbelts, keep all arms, legs inside the ride as we get ready to go on this journey. All right, and so I just want to give you a bit of context to the study. If you haven't figured it out by now, we were honored to work on a project for the city of Lorraine. Uh, the city of Lorraine, uh, just for spatial context, is 39 minutes west of Cleveland, 41 minutes east of Sandusky, and 62 minutes north of Akron. Uh, nicknamed the International City, Lorraine has a total uh, area of 24 square miles, which is about 11,000 football fields. Um, fun and random fact, uh, Lorraine is home to the Charles Berry Basquiat Bridge, which is the second largest Basquiat Bridge in the world. The number one is in Hamburg, Germany. So it's a little something to toot our horn. I, I'm now going to pass this over to Greta Thomas as she takes us more into our study. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, this image shows the three conceptual districts we are focusing on within the study area in Lorraine. Zone one is mainly uh, residential, but does include some small retail on these side streets like West Six. Uh, zone two includes the Broadway Avenue thoroughfare and central business district um, and the Black River Landing Park along the riverfront. Um, zone three consists of two major sites that we will be focusing on a lot towards the end of the presentation. Uh, the existing city hall site, which is right here, and then Pellet Terminal is this large swath of land that has riverfront access and access to Lake Erie. Uh, utilizing Lorraine's built environment, historical past, and cultural identity, Legacy City Planners aims to improve upon the foundations of connectivity, commerce, and cohesiveness to advance the vibrancy of downtown Lorraine. Downtown Lorraine is a historic urban core that has seen a resurgence in the last 10 years. Once vacant properties have been replaced with an array of local commercial ventures, exemplifying the revival of the city. Downtown Lorraine also has several large development sites like Pellet Terminal and City Hall, which are attractive options for adaptive waterfront redevelopment. Bringing vacancy, uh, bringing vibrancy and diversity of activity the city needs. We are seeking to improve upon and expand the con existing conditions by promoting connectivity, walkability, sustainability, and cohesiveness in the current built environment while balancing the same aims with the proposed redevelopments. 
In doing so, we hope to restore and preserve values of viability, livability, and vibrancy in downtown Lorraine that will be enjoyable for generations to come. And next we have Erica Tinerello. So Lorraine was founded um, on the Black River, uh, stretching two banks uh, that are mainly connected by the Erie Avenue Bridge up at the front. The West Bank contains the main commercial core, which is this Broadway Avenue, and the East Bank was essentially used as residential overflow from the main city. On Broadway Avenue, the west side of the street saw more development than the east side of the street due to conflicts with the railroad not allowing side street development. The death of the Black River allowed the American Shipbuilding Company to build some of the largest vessels of fresh, on fresh water and for a variety of sizes of ships to enter the harbor for repairs. The closest of being by Black River made property in high demand, which resulted in long uninterrupted commercial core on Broadway Avenue. Down the river was the U.S. Steel Corporation, Lorraine Works. The mill was the largest unit for the company and it was also a self-contained steel plant. The Lorraine port could handle about 7 million gross tons of raw materials in a given season. One of the biggest events in Lorraine's history was the Lorraine Sandusky tornado, which happened on June 28, 1924. About within 15 minutes, about 70 people were killed and 1,200 people were injured. Damage occurred on Broadway Avenue to residents and businesses and also destroyed industrial warehouses. This event is why many of the buildings along Broadway are built after the 1920s with only a few original structures surviving. The lake continued to, the city continued to modernize and expand outward, mainly adhering to the shoreway and to the river. Most of the land by the river was devoted to transportation. With over 30,000 feet of river frontage, the railroad had about 45% of the land, while industries had about 28% of the land, with leaving less than 30% of river frontage to residents. There are 10 historical structures within our study area, and five of which are actually on Broadway. We have the Duane Building, the Palace Theater, the Eagles Building, the Area Hotel, and the U.S. Post Office. Now I'll have Schneer with the demographics. Thank you, Erica. <clears throat> so when planning an area, it's important to recognize who we're planning for. Here's a quick demographic breakdown of the study area and some helpful comparisons to the city and county of Lorain, Ohio. Just some quick facts, we have a little over 6,500 residents, a median age of 33 years old, a little bit over median income of 24,000, and a pretty high poverty rate of 38%. Going on to the racial breakdown, we have the Black or African American alone population is the largest minority group at 30%, followed by other at 3%. That's a pretty steep drop off. It's also important to note that there is a rather large Hispanic population in the study area, but it was not included in this graph due to the fact that uh, that is an ethnic group, not a racial group, but we do go into more detail in our report. Looking at the population change over time, we see that the city of Lorraine and the study area both lost population from 2010 to 2019, but with the one good caveat that the county of Lorraine gained population. So how can we capture some of this population gain and bring it into the study area? Also important to note that the study area lost more population than the city did. So that suggests some lateral movement within the population where people are moving from the study area to the city of Lorraine. Capturing some of that or you know, making sure that people stay here is uh, of the utmost importance to our group. Next we have Patrick with the housing technology. So the, <clears throat> the study area has mostly single family and multi-family houses. They were built about uh, 1900s, 1923, 1930. There are some triplexes. We're also looking at uh, uh, a big apartment building with 12 stories uh, closer to Broadway. This is all within the study area. We have some brick buildings like this one here, but mostly wood uh, frames. And then on Broadway, we have mixed use with retail and condominiums or apartments on top. And uh, these would be potential candidates, right? Next, we have Anthony with current housing conditions. So for the current housing conditions, uh, we relied a lot on a report that Kirby Date and her team completed in January of 2021, uh, a comprehensive housing assessment and needs analysis for the city of Lorraine. Uh, we use this report in combination with our own findings to highlight the current conditions of Lorraine's housing market. Housing options for the higher income individuals we found are needed. About 10% of Lorraine's households make over $100,000, and about 4% in the two census tracts of our study area. Uh, these households are underserved, but have a strong connection to the city of Lorraine. Low income housing options were also found to be needed and housing for fixed income seniors. 
70% of Lorraine's households are below the area median income. Over 33% spend 30 plus percent on housing. The existing residential market is also a strong market to try to cater to. Many, many residents in Lorraine indicate a high level of satisfaction and commitment to staying in Lorraine. As we found firsthand during our library survey sessions, residents seem to really care about their properties despite the economic conditions um, that's caused a slight population decline over the past 10 years. The population has stayed fairly consistent. Um, rehabilitation to existing properties is critical. Overall, most of the housing in Lorraine is good bones and it's in good condition. Um, it's just in need of updates and repairs. According to Kirby's report, there are over 5,000 C and D rated structures, uh, units rather, housing units that need to be a part of the primary focus to help meet future housing needs of the lower and fixed income areas. And Catherine is next. So this is the current zoning for the study area. There are five use categories and the majority of the Broadway corridor as well as the area where the waterfront redevelopment sites are are zoned for mixed use development. And there are some residential uses within the areas that are zoned for general commercial. Um, this is the current land use. Um, we can see that the pellet terminal and the city hall sites are city owned parcels. And this large parcel is the Black River Landing Park. Um, it's mostly office and retail uses along Broadway. And there you can see the housing in the Western portion of the site near the neighborhoods. Um, the study area also has 133 vacant parcels and 56 parking parcels. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paul Triolo with the environmental conditions. Uh, so impervious surfaces are hardscaped areas such as parking lots, uh, pavements, and rooftops that water is not able to permeate through. Um, while they do not directly cause pollution, they can degrade water quality and aquatic habitats and lead to more stormwater runoff and increased flooding. Uh, the study area's overall estimated impervious surface percentage is very high at 75.7%. Uh, but there is a lot of variation between the study area itself with City Hall, the Broadway corridor, and the shopping plaza between East 4th and East 5th streets seeing higher than average um, impervious surfaces. In a similar vein, uh, using the National Land Cover data set from 2016, we estimated the tree canopy coverage to be only 1.3% in the study area. Um, the ideal citywide canopy cover is 40%. But that threshold differs depending on the type of neighborhood. Uh, generally, American Forest recommends 25% for urban neighborhoods and 15% for central business districts. Um, while this was a little bit outdated in the data sense, um, in order to account for those limitations, we sampled over 200 random points in the study area using the iTree Canopy tool. Um, that estimated the tree canopy coverage to be 11%, which is still below both of those thresholds. Additionally, on our site visit, we observed tree maintenance issues, especially on young trees planted along the Broadway corridor as part of the recent streetscaping project. Uh, due to the high amount of impervious surfaces and low tree canopy coverage in our study area, downtown Lorraine does have a significant urban heat island in the summer months. Uh, this map shows which areas are hotter than the average temperature for the city as a whole. And we can see similar patterns with the Broadway corridor and uh, that shopping plaza have very high um, anomalies in heat. Uh, this does represent a snapshot in time and is not indicative of changes in temperature throughout the day. Uh, so there are numerous environmental hazards which can constrict new development within the study area. Steep slopes generally follow along the course of the Black River and are especially pronounced in the southeast uh, by the Amcor site. Um, there are seven potential brownfields in the study area, the most pronounced of which is the Pellet Terminal site up here, but there are several other smaller brownfields scattered throughout the study area itself. Um, there are 18 total underground storage tanks within our study area. Um, all of them are closed, meaning they are not actively in use and that no action is really required and they're not leaking. Um, there are floodplains as we are along the Black River. Um, they're mostly present on the pellet terminal sites. Uh, the 500 year floodplain extends about 150 feet into the pellet terminal at two points, and the 100 year floodplain extends about 20 to 30 feet. Um, 
while only the 100 year floodplain is a special flood hazard layer um, from FEMA, um, consideration should be made beyond that as with the onset of climate change, um, the Great Lakes region is expected to see more heavy uh, rain events. All right. Uh, within the practice of planning, we normally conduct a SWOT analysis to better understand our study area. Utilizing site visits, data analysis, and research conducted by our team, we have outlined the study area's <clears throat> strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats. The major strengths of the downtown Lorraine area are its waterfront access to both the Black River and Lake Erie. The narrowing of Broadway into a two-lane road also strengthens the built environment of the corridor. Additionally, Lorraine boasts a unique history, uh, especially being the birthplace of the famous Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning novelist, Toni Morrison. The weaknesses of the study area are mainly dominated by the lack of connectivity between Broadway and Black River Landing. Uh, the lack of housing variety and the need for rehab also weaken the corridor and detract foot traffic. Uh, and lastly, the city hall property is neither the highest nor best use for a valuable parcel close to the waterfront, waterfront and Black River Landing. Opportunities for the study area include establishing cohesive branding and wayfinding tools that are currently absent or inconsistent. Uh, capacity build out to support a local business incubator is also a big opportunity. Uh, and lastly, significant waterfront development, particularly the pellet terminal and city hall property we have previously mentioned. Uh, some of these threats apply to Lorraine, but our most substantial threats to the study area are twofold. One being facade depreciation, second being inactive commercial property owners who hold storefront space out of reach to the general public and commerce along Broadway. And next we have Sam and Keenan with community engagement. Thank you, Brad. So with the overview of community engagement and the interactions among residents, uh, for the surveys and stakeholder interviews were conducted to engage with the Lorraine community. Surveys were conducted by Qualtrics. Surveys came in physical copies, QR codes, or a shareable link that people can use to access the surveys anonymously. And the survey consists of 21 questions with five demographic questions. And with four survey response, th those have been conducted in survey and students were teamed up in pairs. And we set up the table in the Lorraine and the Lorraine Public Library in its front atrium. Next slide. Okay, as you can see here, this is the map of uh, all the home zip codes. Um, the majority of that chose the answer, 40 respondents live in, within the range of Lorraine, but we also have other uh, residents that live outside of Lorraine. Next slide. Okay, so with the month around age, the majority of respondents fall in the 50 to 64 age bracket, but the next highest would be the youngest between ages 18 to 29 years of age. Next slide. Uh, within race and ethnicity, um, about 75% or three fourths of residents are white, but about 14% among re respondents are Hispanic or Latino, and they are the second highest, and African Americans excuse me, make up the third as the highest. Next slide. Um, within the estimated household income, the majority of residents have an estimated income of around 60,000. However, there was a significant gap of income between 30 and 50,000. Next slide. And, and now I'm gonna introduce Sam who will do the primary findings and and present our results. So among our primary findings, we found that the main reasons for going to the downtown Broadway district are dining, entertainment, and the Rockin' on the River concerts at Black River Landing during the summer. And it's also important to notice that grocery and personal services were the least chosen answer. A majority of survey takers say the biggest obstacle to coming to the area is there not being an, an enough to do at 61%. And it's important to add that 24% claim this, that safety and this perception of crime is also an obstacle to coming to, to the area. We found that the most wanted types of businesses are retail shops, sit down dining restaurants, and art galleries and boutiques. And comments from survey takers here on, here on the side indicate that they want small, diverse businesses and mixed use buildings. 
Among the most wanted in, in improvements, we found that outdoor dining, benches, and more flowers and street trees were the top chosen answer. And comments from survey takers indicate they, they want to see improvements mainly in safety and, and green spaces throughout the area. To highlight on other important comments from survey takers, people want to see businesses with roots in, in, in Lorraine. They want more advertising of downtown events and residents are tired of owners of empty buildings doing nothing with those spaces. The key findings that emerged through our stakeholder interviews were organized into, into a SWOT chart seen here. And it's important to keep in mind that the stakeholder main takeaway SWAT is it, it essentially mirrors the SWAT chart that we created for our existing con conditions. And now we are going into the market study. All righty, so uh, one of the first tasks of our real estate team, our market study team was to establish our primary primary marketing area. Uh, we did this using a uh, business analyst, which is a GIS software. Um, and we played around with a couple of different uh, drive time buffers. Um, we ultimately ended up settling on a five minute drive time, drive time range around our study area uh, due to the scope of the project. Uh, this allowed us to use census data to develop the number of households and figure out the average household in income um, which ultimately gave us our buying power. You can see that the five minute drive time range uh, is a little more than half a billion dollars. Uh, this information is important because when the city wants to attract um, businesses to come in, they can see what this district represents and how much money there is to spend. Um, Anthony is going to go forward with some more implementation about how the analysis works. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, and give a brief overview about the retail niche analysis process that we went through. On this slide, you'll see several retail niche categories right here. As part of our retail research, we took an inventory of all the retail businesses within that five minute drive time that Jimmy spoke about. This is from the central point in Broadway, that five minute drive time. This data was obtained through Reference USA. There was over 350 businesses in that initial list. These, business, these businesses were then sifted through and verified by cross-checking with Google, uh, Google Maps, Yelp, calling, visiting, Etc. to add or delete any businesses that may no longer be there or may have been missed. Keep here. We then took verified, uh, we took this verified data of retail businesses and categorized them into the retail niche categories. Uh, most of which you see here, this came from Kirby Dates general business model, these categories. Create the analysis you see here, we had to obtain existing square footage of these businesses and sales data. Square footages were gathered through CoStar and the Roofprint GIS data that was verified through Google Earth one by one. So we had to go through each of these businesses and verify the size of them, uh, that they were there, uh, and then collect sales data. Uh, we got this information through Data Axle. The buying power, as Jimmy described, was used in combination with the percentage of income spent on specific retail categories. This came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics where people are spending their money it's a general percentage. Uh, the existing square footage and sales data were combined uh, to come up with a supported square footage number for each retail category. This story tells us the difference between the existing square footage of each retail category and then what our five minute drive time buying power can support. Um, we then came up with a leakage. Now, these are most of the positive categories that said we had some store leakage out of our five minute drive time. Go to the next slide. And this is the top five categories that we decided to focus on and highlight. Uh, the top one in the previous slide was dentist office. So it's kind of a, an outlier or misrepresentation. But here you see grocery stores, restaurants, entertainment, venues, clothing and shoes, accessories, personal care and health and personal care stores. A lot of these categories were also highlighted by survey respondents and things that they thought Lorraine would need. So it kind of makes sense. Okay. So we're looking at the um, network analysis uh, map by ESRI. The transparent green area is a five minute walk service area based on the businesses you see here on the right. And these are categorized for food access. 
So you can see that the grocery stores, we have only one within our study area, and there are only three within the five minute drive time of uh, Lorraine. This begs the question that we probably need more grocery stores in that area. Um, as the survey indicated, uh, uh, citizens and residents want to have more retail, and we are looking at clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, miscellaneous retail, home furnishing, and we can see there is some here, but there's definitely more room to build out, and uh, the five-minute study area is here again. And now we are looking at all kinds of services, including health services and personal care services like a uh, barber shop, like a tattoo shop, like a beauty spa, pet services as well. And we can see we have dental services in orange. We have someone here with eye services here. Uh, we lack a little bit in personal care stores. That would be a pharmacy or something like a uh, barber shop. There's not much going on here either. So that would probably be a good fit for the study area as well. Uh, when it comes to recreational activities like fitness, uh, hobby, crafts, or entertainment, there's not much going on in the study area as well. Um, we have the Lorraine Palace Theater here. Um, we have some coin collecting shop here. And um, that's about it. So that would be a big game for the city. So Anthony will talk more about the weekend. So here you will see the residential vacancy rate comparison of our two census tracts with Lorain County and the state of Ohio. Uh, this is a strong indicator of the importance of the revitalize, revitalization efforts that need to take place in the two census tracts um, of our study area. The map to the right shows the type of vacant land and structures in our study area along Broadway. You can see here, there's a large amount of commercial vacancy along Broadway that should be prioritized. Lorraine has a higher than desired vacancy rate, about 18% of its land is vacant. Some of the government owned parcels on this map indicated by the blue right there. Uh, they should really be incorporated into the redevelopment proposals that will come along later in this report to facilitate important connections and public uses relative to the waterfront. Uh, vacancy, as Sam kind of touched on, it can kind of influence the perception of safety in an area. Uh, this is another reason to try to focus, focus on these vacancies along Broadway is to improve public morale and image of this area. All right, so one of the final studies that we completed was a housing market study. I'm using the two census tracts that mainly make up uh, the downtown study area. Um, we use that information combined with census data that we collected to pull out and see what the demand and supply of what the study area could, could afford. Uh, some of the more alarming, but still uh, congruent findings that we found was the need for uh, subsidized housing of some sort in the study area. Um, you can see that the demand is really high when it comes to um, the amount of money that people are making um, under $20,000 and the amount of housing that they could afford. Um, so we're definitely looking at some type of subsidized housing um, this was a surprising one when we looked at incomes over $150,000 that, but again, it went along with the study that Kirby Date did to support that some luxury housing could be a sustainable inside downtown Lorraine. And so these are the incomes and the a pretty much a, a approximate amount of rent affordability or a home, home price range that could be built. And so we are gonna try to satisfy some of these housing needs with our upcoming recommendations. And now on to plan goals. All right. Using our existing condition um, conditions findings, we will transition to the planning work applied to the study area at large. Our team drafted our four main goals upon the city's desired project outcomes and our own analysis. Goal one focuses on orienting connectivity in the study area through rebranding, wayfinding, street redesigns, and multimodal infrastructure. Goal two focuses solely on new development efforts. Goal three strives to enhance the public realm by bridging Broadway to Black River Landing, increasing walkability, streetscaping, complete streets interventions, environmental upgrades, and public safety. Goal four narrows down efforts to support the local economy in Lorraine through commercial facades and design standards, vacancy recovery, and diversifying the housing stock. The remainder of this presentation will include our team's overall recommendations with these goals integrated throughout each conceptual zone.
Next, we have the study area-wide recommendations. So these recommendations that are not zone specific and we envision them as something that should be planned for the entire district. So as mentioned before, a primary goal of this project is to increase connectivity and cohesion within the district. So to achieve this, we first examined existing conditions and then analyzed them for potential improvements. As you can see, the dark blue are existing streets and the dark green are existing trails. Washington Avenue was identified as a trail due to the presence of bike lanes. Getting right into the improvements, we have a sidewalk improvement along West 6th that we envision as a pedestrian residential entryway into the downtown Broadway district from the adjacent residential community. We wanna make it safe and viable for community members to get on foot into historic downtown Broadway and also make it feel like it's their district too. Next, we have their street redesigns that we're gonna get into more detail soon. Basically, we saw that Black River Lane and West Erie Avenue are ripe for street redesign. Multi-use trail, this is uh, a key cog in our report that we see as a multi-purpose, multimodal trail that can increase both bike connectivity and activity within and around the district. Neighborhood greenways are secondary, safer feeder streets for bike users to get on and off a trail and circulate safely. In this particular example, if you were to use this multi use trail onto the West 9th Street, you could safely circulate onto Washington Avenue and use that for all that it will take you towards. Large wayfinding and small wayfinding. These are not the official terminology in our report, but for this overarching concept map, they're meant to mean large wayfinding is gonna include components like entryways, maps, that sort of thing. Small wayfinding is gonna be uh, smaller circulatory components, more along the lines of here is a parking lot or pointing you towards a landmark. Moving right into the street redesigns, first we have Black River Lane. So currently Black River Lane has uh, two lanes, two way, 14 foot drive lanes. 14 foot drive lanes are very large and they encourage a lot of unsafe behavior by the automotive user. Um, speeding, other sorts of reckless driving. It also makes it uncomfortable for the pedestrian user to engage with that street. Also making it uncomfortable for the pedestrian user to engage with the street is a sidewalk that adjusts right next to the drive lane. This can make it feel like the cars are right next to you even when they're not. Um, there's also parking lots on both sides that can make the district feel enclosed, but not in a good way. So our recommendations are to match the other side, create a sidewalk on both sides that make it safe for the user to engage with the space, also a buffer zone that separates the pedestrian user and the automotive user, and an amenity lane that allows us to implement um, allows us to implement wayfinding elements that help the user circulate within the district. Our largest implementation idea here is to change it from a two lane, two way street into a one lane, one way street with parking on both sides. There are a couple different reasons for this. The first one being the large drive lanes make it so that this is a very attractive option for people who want to avoid using the Broadway Road street diet to go over here and circumvent that, that street diet. So we recommend that this would help to encourage users going through downtown Broadway. Also, um, when coming to events like Rockin' on the River, it would help to enable people to circulate back through historic downtown Broadway, instead of currently where people can circumvent and go right up to Charles Berry Bridge and go east. Um, another thing that it would help with is the parking on both sides will enable us to reclaim some of the parking from the parking lots and create inviting entryways uh, for the Broadway facing shops to have inviting entryways on the Black River Lane side. Now moving on to the West Erie Avenue current design. So East Erie Avenue, also known as the Charles Berry Basketball Bridge and West Erie Avenue past Oberlin are both four lane two way streets. But right over here in front of City Hall, that is suddenly opens up into a six lane two way street. So we recommend matching that same exact design. What happens when you have a two lane that opens up into a three lane, it can get a little bit dicey. Automotive users are going to speed up. They're going to try and get around people. They're going to try and merge, and then they're going to have to merge right back. So it promotes unsafe driving behavior, and it can also make it uncomfortable for the pedestrian user to get across. We promote uh, and envision the creation of parking lanes that will help to reclaim some of this space and turn it into a calmer area that matches the true feel of the district. We also recommend uh, the addition of a cycle track due to the large curb here that could help be a vital node to connect some of our multi-use trail network um, with some of the current existing frameworks such as Lakeview Beach and Lakeview Park and our neighborhood Greenway project. So our recommended bike routes were developed with the idea of strengthening and further enhancing similar planning efforts already underway. Uh, an example of one of those is the Lorraine Active Transportation Plan, which was completed in 2018 and is a hybrid active transportation school travel plan. Um, 
This plan has several plan routes within our study area, many of which are further enhanced or directly incorporated into our recommendations. So for example, their plan West 6 uh, school walking route, sidewalk improvements are extended all the way to Broadway in our recommendations. Uh, the planned West Erie Avenue uh, community walking route sidewalk improvements um, are further enhanced by our proposed street redesign. Um, their plan West, West 8th and Reed Avenue bike neighborhood greenways um, provide vital north, south, and east, west connections into adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, the built Washington Avenue bike lanes provide additional north, south connection and also connect to potential new development sites such as the Stoberg site and South Lorraine in general. Uh, finally, our proposed Overland Avenue bike lanes fill a significant gap in this active transportation framework. Um, they also complement the planned sidewalk improvements along Overland Avenue and will connect the proposed new developments on Pellet Terminal and City Hall with the broader bike network in general. Beyond downtown Lorraine, future considerations need to be made to connect the city's trail and bikeway network to the broader regional framework of trails in the Lorraine County Metro Park system, such as the Black River Bikeway and the North Coast Inland Trail, which connect the cities of Lorraine to Illyria and Oberlin. Our proposed multi-use trail is a first step in establishing a future connection from the historic downtown Broadway district um, across uh, the Henderson Road Bridge to a proposed extension of the Steel Mill Trail. This will connect a direct trail link from these regional links ending in the historic downtown Broadway district. Um, with that, a clear specified trail as it currently is, uh, cyclists can use neighborhood routes, um, but additional wayfinding is needed at regional trailheads to direct um, trail users to the historic downtown Broadway district. So in 2019, Lorraine underwent a new streetscape on Broadway Avenue, including uh, new gateways and uh, new banners. And they also have trash cans that feature the city seal. The mixing of the two uh, brands kind of creates confusion. So we need one cohesive brand that will, um, that will define the area. So recently, uh, just a couple months ago, the city of Lorraine was able to designate the downtown core um, as a historic district, um, the National Register of Historic Places. So we look to rebrand the entire study area as the historic downtown Broadway district to incorporate the new designation. We will create a single logo that will define the area's brand and feature the updated version of uh, the Lorraine Lighthouse. The current gateways are along Broadway Avenue at the intersections of West Erie Avenue, West 4th Street, and West 9th Street. We look to also propose to add another motorist gateway at West Erie and Oberlin Avenue. And we will look to add a pedestrian gateway at the intersection of Washington and West 6th uh, Street. Um, this is to show that the residents, uh, the proximity of Broadway Avenue. At the intersection of Broadway Avenue and West 6th Street, we will also have a main map kiosk by the Palace Theater. We propose uh, for the current and uh, proposed gateways to reuse the existing structure that is already there and rebrand them with the new district name and the updated uh, Lorraine Lighthouse logo. Scaling down to the pedestrian level, we want to highlight Lorraine's history in steel making and uh, shipbuilding, mixing aluminum and oak wood. Oak trees were plentiful around the area, so it was the primary material used to build ships. The district logo is also featured at the top of the kiosk, and it, uh, the steel and the wood together in a river pattern reminds people that the Black River is just a block away. There are four public parking lots, that, are, and so we are proposing that each lot have a public uh, parking identification <laughs> sign with a unique name. Then parking directionals will also be placed around Broadway Avenue, West Erie Avenue, and Black River Lane. The pedestrian gateway also follows a similar design to the motorist gateways. Each zone within our study area has a typical usage, so we use different colors to make distinctive zones within the district itself. The iconography signs feature historical photos of, the, of their area and showcase amenities available and include directional signage. The top light blue highlights the Black River because it connects all zones together. We crafted two sets of banners to help users engage with the district. 
The first set is a series that uses historical images overlaid on tourist style verbiage to show the user that they've arrived in a district full of life. The second is a series that we've called Lovingly Lorraine, meant to be homage to and from Lorraine. Turns of phrases specific to the area help craft a sense of civic pride and recognition of the district fully realized. Banner colors correlate to their particular zones and feature the updated historic downtown Broadway logo. This is also the overall sign family to show that all of them go co cohesively together. Um, so um, in order to, uh, yeah. So environmental efforts can have a significant positive effect uh, contributing to increased public safety, walkability and better public health um, and the beautification of the public realm. Um, first, we recommend uh, strengthening and growing the study area's tree canopy cover through the development of a comprehensive tree canopy assessment and tree plan uh, for the downtown Broadway district and the city of Lorraine as a whole. Uh, this will identify new areas for tree plantings along public right of ways and publicly owned lots and priority areas for existing tree maintenance. Second, we recommend the permanent cleaning and greening of five priority green lots throughout the study area. This includes the lot adjacent to Veterans Memorial Park, which has an existing playground on it, which can be incorporated directly into the park system. Uh, two Lorraine Public Library owned lots right on the, on the West 6th Street uh, near the border with Washington Avenue. Uh, there, the library currently runs a community garden on the lot across the street from its main branch. Um, and the lot, the former West, the former, um, the former first evangelical church lot on Washington Avenue is directly across the street from Admiral King Elementary School. Uh, the permanent greening of these lots can be transformational to the feel of West Six, the key neighborhood gateway to Broadway. It can also be the site of additional neighborhood amenities such as a dog park. Um, there are also two lots on Broadway at the intersection of West Seventh and West Sixth. West 7th and West 8th streets, um, which we recommend engaging with local business owners to explore the possibility of adding outdoor seating um, to really activate these corners of the historic main street. Um, third, we propose softening impervious surfaces within the downtown Broadway district to reduce stormwater runoff. Um, we recommend reviewing parking and impervious surface standards and require that landscape buffers and green infrastructure be incorporated into parking lot resurfacing plans. Uh, we also recommend incorporating, incorporating permeable pavers um, and greenery into redesigns of the alleyways between Broadway and Black River Land. Uh, finally, we recommend completing the brownfield remediation of the pellet terminal site and ensure that any new development is low impact and includes environmental amenities by incorporating that directly into the request for a proposal. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about zone one, the neighborhood, uh, smaller retail revitalization area. The yellowish beige area on the map indicates the neighborhood and smaller retail areas, uh, which is all of it. The housing revitalization policy areas are indicated by the blue dotted lines. And then you have some connectivity and public right of way enhancement shown there on the map as well. So effective revitalization uh, of the housing area is going to need going to involve a collaborative effort amongst government entities, local business holders, residents, and other social agencies such as LCCAA and Habitat for Humanity, etc. Um, right. Some recommendations for the housing revitalization aspect that we talked about that is critical. Uh, Lorain County currently has something called the CHIP program. It's a community housing impact and preservation program. Uh, the city of Lorain is currently not a part of that program, I think along with maybe Overland. Uh, these programs offer forgivable loans for home rehabs and free home repairs for those who are at least, I think, 80, less than 80% of the AMI, the area median income. This is something that the city should investigate becoming a part of if they haven't already there seems to be some benefit available there in the terms of uh, community, community development block grant funding. Um, promoting and expanding the city's current loan program, I know they offer something along these lines. Similar to Cuyahoga County, they have a help, uh, help loan program called the Housing Enhancement Loan Program, where below market rate loans can be given out. Um, promoting, uh, recommending we promote and look into expanding what the city currently offers to make that wider uh, 
more widely available to current residents. A partnership with Lorain County JVS Trades Programs is also recommended to help complete maybe low cost or free home repairs uh, for revitalizing uh, rehab needed properties. Uh, permission of ADUs or accessory dwelling units is recommended in both rehabs and new construction. Uh, this will help address fixed income seniors who will now have a whole new option uh, for, ho for housing to choose from. Uh, housing management system is also recommended by Kirby Dates Report, and we are also recommending that uh, this would be a vital resource in helping to initiate and monitor these re revitalization efforts, as well as the initiation of property foreclosure and recycling of properties through the R Lorain County Land Bank. I'm not sure how active the city of Lorain is currently in, in pursuing that, but some kind of housing management system would help. Uh, a landlord registration is also recommended. Uh, along with the city's current foreclosure registration that they have to help this housing management system achieve results. Uh, landlords being required uh, to be in communication or face fines. Uh, sometimes reaching property owners can prove to be the most difficult part of dealing with those vacant properties. So we're promoting, recommending another method to try to be able to reach out to them. Right up. All right, thank you, Anthony. Zone two features the Broadway Central Business District and Black River Landing Park, which we see outlined in this uh, light blue area. Uh, our concept map shows that we will be focusing on facade improvements and general connectivity. All right, beginning with the city's GIS data and a few other resources, we identified non-contributing facades along Broadway. These are color-coded pink on the map and contributing facades are marked in green. Uh, we use the city's tax delinquent parcel data to identify parcels that may be both tax delinquent and non-contributing. This creates a log of specific properties that the city can subsequently address in the short term. This before and after uh, photo example is taken from a 2017 storefront design program in Toledo. Uh, the before example right here um, is considered non-contributing. And as you can tell, the after example appears to be far more contributing to the district. This particular example is important because it imitates the physical, economic, and aesthetic conditions to Lorraine and provides a reference for the desired outcome the city is trying to achieve. To focus on the distinction between contributing and non-contributing facades, we have a collection of examples to visualize the differences. Um, and these are all examples within our study area. Uh, the non-contributing frontages have a variety of issues, including old outdated signage, signs not matching the business service provided, a myriad of building uh, frontage materials, limited window displays and coverage, and improper lighting, just to name a few. We recommend that the city adopts and codifies the new commercial design standards, which we uh, have in full in our report. From these new commercial design standards, there are a few strategies legacy city planners deem priority. First is to adopt blade signage that should be implemented to increase business visibility. Awnings are of second priority and would need to match the blade signage. Um, and lastly, adopt the initiative from Janasco Insurance, which includes referencing historical imagery of the property acquired from the Historical Society. This process prioritizes the historical character and framework of the building. We highly recommend using this strategy moving forward and especially in the city's uh, existing minor storefront renovation program. The site model here shows the Broadway block um, and its built environment characteristics. We were tasked by the city to come up with ways to create connectivity from the commercial district to the park and vice versa. There are several types of connectors along Broadway the city can use to boost safety, activity, and excitement. As of right now, these spaces are empty and unwelcoming. These connectors are identified here as public realm, palace alley, and pedestrian through lines. The pedestrian through lines are existing paths or walkways that can be easily reconstructed using lighting, landscaped greenery, murals, seating, decorative fencing, and painted pavement. Palace Alley here is outlined in red, and it's here right up on the map, um, and that is due to its priority among the proposed interventions. This alley is also the widest and most efficient space to begin placemaking and enhancement efforts and can serve as an area for flea markets, live music, and other small events. 
to help visualize the interventions we are proposing, we have examples of a few existing conditions along Broadway paired with our placemaking recommendations. This before and after example um, shows that seating and shade through this street canopy coverage right here um, create a much more attractive and safe space. On the left right here is an image uh, from the study area. Most of this open space is asphalt parking, and that is completely empty during midday when people are usually visiting and working or doing other activities in the study area. It should be at least halfway full. This could be an example where the city could reclaim that parking space to expand the public realm. Towards Broadway, you can see right here uh, that we see, okay, so you can see right here that this is sidewalk access to Broadway without vehicle access. That is important because it's a great step forward in addressing reclaiming like public realm space in this area. The photo on the right is from uh, West 25th and Cleveland's Ohio City neighborhood. We see the previously mentioned interventions that elevate the built environment. Bonus points too for the permeable pavement Mitchells uses right here that uh, allows for better stormwater absorption and runoff. All right, and then we have our Palace Alley upgrade. Through implementing the previously mentioned public realm amenities, this space can become an attraction for any user. Making sure both ends of the alley are inviting is key to ensuring that foot traffic to and from uh, Broadway and Black River Landing that the city really needs. We are also recommending that the city consider efforts to insulate or extend the seasonality of this alley so it can continue to be used during non-summer months. And the Palace Alley Enhancement should also prioritize family-friendly space so a wider variety of users can enjoy the downtown area. And lastly, we are proposing Broadway and West 6 as the city's main signature intersection. This crossroad is the center of our West 6 pedestrian gateway um, and residential entryway and provides a pop of vibrancy and color that lets the user know that they've arrived to historic downtown Broadway. And we also recommend using river symb symbology and movement on Broadway to let users know that Black River is just an alleyway away. And I will talk about some recommendations for the retail revitalization. Um, so for the commercial property along Broadway, um, including creating and implementing you know, the zoning code, uh, a fine structure of varying levels, that will be effective to create action on the part of property owners who let property simply sit empty or fall by the wayside in the new and improved Broadway district. An example is shown on the screen there. Uh, we want to induce action uh, so they do something. Creating this fine structure, um, implementing beautification standards and requirements for window art and window treatments into the zoning code should also be considered as this will help uh, the appearance of vacancy. Another method to ensure you have property owners involved that are responsive and care about the property. Vacant land tax is also an idea that the city could look into. Uh, this would be based on the next best, uh, highest and best use of a property as it sits vacant. Um, this is a stretch, but you could tax the property owner for not doing anything with the property. Um, all of these fines and backlogs of taxes, et cetera, could be used to reclaim these properties if the property owners are not responsive. Um, this is a way to try to recycle some of this vacancy. All these suggestions, um, yeah, can lead to the recycling of these properties. Another suggestion is a business incubator program to facilitate and promote possibly a rotating monthly use of vacant storefronts or government spaces for small businesses to gain exposure uh, and make some revenue for the city available from these vacant parcels. Promoting to formalize and expand the capacity of Main Street, of Main Street Lorraine, the proposed uh, CDC to take on this role uh, with two new positions added to oversee the implementation of these and the other programs mentioned in the presentation uh, of our report. All righty, so we finally have arrived at zone three, um, our the former Pellet Terminal site, also known as Black River North. Hopefully you're awake. If not, this is your moment to get your yawns out and wake up. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have identified uh, three major redevelopment sites on this uh, in this zone. Um, we have our these two sites, both on the pellet terminal and the city hall site. And as you see, we're gonna continue with those connectivity recommendations and the proposed bike path will go all the way up leading to the uh, finger piers. And so this was one of the more challenging um, aspects that our team spent a lot of time discussing 
Um, we, we were faced with bringing a new development to a vacant waterfront site um, that would not detract from existing historic downtown uh, Broadway. Um, our research and our survey results, um, we found that people were looking for ways to, to engage and interact with downtown Lorraine, um, but the current lack of entertainment, shopping, and housing options served as barriers to that engagement. Um, we also wanted to make sure that any development that we uh, came up with was equitable and was gonna be able to be used by everyone. And so uh, a quote by Jane Jacobs really led us to our, to our results. Um, she said that you can't rely on bringing people downtown, you have to put them there. And so with that in mind, we decided to focus on bringing redevelopment that would not only draw people to the beautiful waterfront, but make it a place called home. And so, you know, you gotta have some imagination here when there's nothing, you gotta see the unseen. And so this is our redevelopment of Black River North. Um, starting with the former City Hall site, um, which we have affectionately dubbed as City Square. Uh, this redevelopment and the, the demolition of City Hall um, and move to, we decided to demolish City Hall and move it to the historic Broadway district. Um, we believe that this will bring more deliberate and consistent foot traffic um, that can be used to, to support the current built environment that is there. Um, the addition of the police presence on Broadway um, will increase and help deal with the perceptions of safety. The, the access of this corner right here and activating this node of Broadway and Erie um, creates an instant sense of place. Um, and the green space ties into some of the existing uh, environmental recommendations and the existing Veterans Memorial Park. This mixed use building um, will consist of first floor, first floor retail and second floor apartments. The infusion of townhomes on the northern end of the site um, allow for the opportunity of mixed development and mixed use income. Um, we can use with the right subsidy, a combination of senior houses, fixed income living, um, and mixed income living in, into the apartments. Um, we also have infused retail from this angle. You can see right here, two retail buildings that will create a very walkable district uh, and, and fill in those much needed gaps of retail. If you look at the lower left-hand corner, um, we have introduced a market or food hall type style building. Uh, this building will allow, uh, allow users to get that sense of Lorraine. Um, if you are familiar with the Van Aken, Van Aken food, food hall, uh, this allows for flavors of Lorraine to be showcased therefore starting up a business incubator kind of type program. Views of the waterfront um, through the window and a uh, walkout deck allowed the Black River to be showcased. And we also have implemented the Riverwalk Pavilion, which will allow families to gather and it'll be a public slash private use development um, with food and public spaces for those to gather that come to the park. As we look at the finally, finally look at the top right section, um, which we call Black River North Residences. Um, we have an infusion of mix of, of apartment and mixed levels of income of townhomes. Uh, this is to help support some of that luxury uh, homes. Who doesn't want to live on the waterfront, right? And so this in phases will allow for us to maximize the density and use this beautiful waterfront uh, to the highest and best use. Um, we also have a entertainment complex that can be used for restaurants, nightlife, uh, to really bring people down and enjoy this waterfront. This is uh, the proposed character of some of the developments. Um, this is just to give you a vision of what our team sees uh, for these townhomes, these mixed use buildings and some of the other construction. Uh, we really uh, got a lot of inspiration from the Uptown Apartments of University Circle that showcase first floor retail with glass frontage, but also this thorough way that lets people walk through and enjoy some of that green space. Uh, take note of the permeable pavers that's down there. Um, we also uh, really like the design of the Oco residential townhomes. Um, any development that we plan on building um, should have some green infrastructure. And we really like to use a reclaimed wood uh, to really showcase and tie back into the history of shipbuilding um, that Lorraine is so fond of. Again, the Black River North, there's many different styles of townhomes. Um, but again, the, the apartment uh, showcases affordable units as well as individual townhomes. We really enjoyed the townhome style because it creates an instant sense of neighborhood and community. So here we have the site plan for the redevelopment. 
Um, you can see it on the former city hall site that we're calling City Square. There's the mixed use retail and apartment building activating the corner and the park space that connects to Veterans Memorial um, Park there and the townhomes on the northern part of the site. Um, on Black River North or the former Pellet Terminal, you see the variety of housing, including townhomes and the apartment building that Jimmy talked about. And we are proposing for the finger piers to be available for public waterfront access. Um, here is the event and entertainment center, and next to it is a very large park with family friendly and recreational amenities, including a splash pad, all abilities playground, volleyball court, and other things that we're going to show in a minute. Um, here is the Riverwalk Pavilion with the restaurant, and also along the river, we have the multi use path and the boardwalk. Um, here's a market hall that's um, available for year round enjoyment, you know, indoors during the winter. Also, people can come and gather. And here is a continuation of retail along Broadway. Here are some of the proposed park amenities, some examples, including the splash pad, the interactive sculpture, raised mounds for kids to play on, and um, swings by the river. We took inspiration from uh, the Cincinnati Riverfront Park, and these amenities would complement the housing that we're proposing, and they're not found in any of the parks that are in Lorraine currently. Here is the transect, looking at the site vertically, going east from the southeast corner of City Hall site towards the riverfront. There's a 24-foot grade change. Um, you can see the mixed-use retail and apartment building on the corner. And as you cross Broadway, you can access the market building from the street. You could continue through and um, access the observation deck to view the lighthouse and the river and the waterfront. Um, we're also proposing for steps to go down to the park space, including bigger steps that people could sit on. And um, here's the Riverwalk Pavilion that also has observation decks and the multi-use path and the boardwalk. So due to the environmental sensitivity of the pellet terminal site, um, it's imperative that Black River North is developed with as little negative environmental impact as possible, as Jimmy was talking about. Um, so site-specific environmental interventions that are incorporated directly into our site plan include bioswales uh, situated between areas where significant amounts of impervious surfaces are added, such as the, the townhomes up here and additional parking lots um, situated between those and the Black River. Um, also bioretention basins strategically placed to mitigate stormwater runoff and permeable pavers used in the construction of any plaza and hard space on the site. New development on this site also gives us a unique opportunity to pair economic development with environmental restoration uh, to further improve the public perception of the district. Uh, we recommend using newly available, available federal infrastructure funds to realize past recommendations from the Lower Black River Ecological Restoration Plan uh, to, be, to be paired with new development on this site. Uh, these include the installation of fish baskets on the finger piers, a strategy which has been tested and employed in the Cuyahoga River, uh, bulkhead reconstruction, uh, which incorporate fish habitats in order to balance infrastructure improvements um, and flood protection along areas where there is flood hazard um, and increasing habitat. Uh, this strategy was also employed directly across the river at the Lorraine Sailing and Yacht Club. Uh, finally, we also recommend cutting into the old bulkhead and constructing a fish shelf habitat by the Lorraine, uh, the Charles Barley Bridge, a strategy which was also employed on the Scrant Peninsula um, in downtown Cleveland by the Towpath Trail. Uh, these strategies can provide interesting design features to the public space and address the Black River area of concerns, remaining beneficial use impairments, of which three of the four are focused on fish populations and aquatic habitats. So this is a depiction of what Black River North could look like. You can see the, an example of the mixed-use retail and apartment building on the corner there. Um, here is an example of the market hall and the steps where people could sit. Um, you can see the proposed retail building on Broadway behind that and the Riverwalk Pavilion. And here's a multi-use path and boardwalk. All right, and so for our final section, we want to talk a little bit about the development. 
of proposal phasing and financials. Anthony, take it away. Okay, so to in order in order to maximize the feasibility of this proposal, we are recommending that the project occur in at least three phases. Phase one would have about two parts. Uh, shown in red highlight, phase one would be the market hall space, Riverwalk retail and pavilion, as well as the public space on the southern portion of the pilot terminal site. This site is most shovel ready and would create the start of an exciting new town square at the corners of Erie and Broadway. This portion of the development will produce income for the construction process and create buzz for people to be excited about the area. Phase 1B, uh, this would be simultaneous demolition and relocation of the current city hall. This is what known as is what is known as fast track construction. Um, while the initial uh, phases of the first phase are going on, um, and it will help facilitate the uh, after the continuing phases of the project. Note the square footage of each space and the hard construction costs on each slide uh, for each portion of the project. It has around about square footage of each space, uh, cost of construction, and then total cost. Phase two would be the Black River North Apartments and Event Center on the northern portion of Pella Terminal site, as well as City Hall Square Retail and Apartment Mixed Use Building, uh, and the surrounding green space on that site as well. This phase of the project is going to bring the people to this newly created hub. We are aiming to increase density with the housing aspect of this phase. The City Hall Square site, the mixed use building, will have three floors in total. As I mentioned, the first floor retail, hopefully like a gym, probably a fitness center would be cool there. <laughs> the top two floors would be housing and it would be about 77 units, uh, around 750 square foot each uh, on these top two floors. As I mentioned, you could uh, stagger or structure this between low income housing and market rate housing. Black River North Apartments also have two floors of housing, about 82 units at 953 square foot each. Over 50,000 square foot of additional retail space will also be coming in uh, in this phase in the form of that event center slash restaurant retail space and the first floor retail over here. That's going to create additional cash flow for the project um, and allow it to remain feasible at this point in time. Uh, phase three would then be townhome construction portion of both of these sites. This would be phase three because these are the most expensive portion of the proposal, which hopefully would be further supported by incoming cash flows from the previous phases. So you can see here the hard construction costs um, for each of these. Uh, and I understand these numbers are very conservative estimates of what it would cost to build these things as we have proposed. Um, so that being said, we would like to put these in over time to densify the area. Phase three is adding over 150 additional units and housing varying from 1,000 square foot to 2,000 square foot. These units will likely be addressing our higher income individuals interested in waterfront living. And you can go on to the next slide. This is gonna be like a financial feasibility stack showing the gap. These are the hard construction costs of each site that we have calculated. Uh, they're pretty expensive projects, as you can see, but we ha also have a financial feasibility included in the appendix of the report, which goes into further detail about the funding options that we have here as identified funding and then the associated gap. You can see the city hall site it has a fairly overcomable size gap, fairly small, 200,000. The gap on the pellet terminal site is slightly larger um, in part to the townhome construction, which we will look to do later in the project. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the funding sources. Go ahead. So some of the funding sources that we're using in this development proposal, uh, public subsidies are something that can be used in a number of ways. We looked at using uh, TIF or ta tax increment financing as one method of funding. TIFs are set up, TIFs set up a, pro a proposed tax increment district where the new increase in property taxes that would be received as part of the increased property values that occur over a certain period of time are then used to pay for the development of the project. This is one way to buy now and pay later. This method allows higher competitiveness in seeking a new tax base as well as attracting jobs to the area. This can also be used for road repairs and things of that nature, which I know are important. Um, new, marks, new market tax credits are also another way to promote uh, maximum private capital being invested into the project. These tax credits offer federal income tax credit to those investors that invest in low income communities. Nord Family Foundation is another source that we identified that can contribute funding, especially 
when their con contributions can help create leverage for other investors to jump on board. The Nord Family Foundation contributes to under-resourced populations. Uh, Public-private partnerships, or P3s, are also an important aspect uh, of the project that should be explored. A public-private partnership is one that is a collaboration between government sector, such as city, ODOT, metro parks, and the private sector, groups that can support financing and operation of aspects of a development. In our case, the maintaining of the waterfront property by the metro parks possibly could be an important partnership to look at, as well as a road contribution by the county, Lorain County, ODOT, et cetera. Uh, P3s usually offer higher offer tax incentives, period, to the private sector entities so they can enable uh, completion of the projects and running these within budget. Uh, Lorain County state and development loans should also be investigated, as I said, with potential ODOT funds um, and, of course, traditional bank loans. Sam will talk about some of the other sources. So, re <clears throat> so regarding our proposed trail and environmental concerns, the Clean Ohio Trails and Recre Recreational Trails programs can be used in combination um, specifically for funding for uh, trail systems that connect to a regional trail system. Um, as PJ mentioned, there's a lot of value to, to that. Um, NOACA's uh, to, uh, Total Livable C Communities in Initiative and Safe Routes to School programs, also with NOACA, um, are designed to increase options and safety for pedestrians and are multimodal um, oriented. Um, partnering with Lorraine Metro Parks could alleviate the city of maintenance costs of this trail and of um, other proposed open green space. The Rails to Trails program um, takes advantage of unused old rail in, in infrastructure to then be used for walkways or pathways for the public. And there's um, a lot of rail in infrastructure in this area. Um, and then for environmental concerns, the Great Lakes Restoration in Initiative targets areas of in environmental concerns, particularly in the Great Lakes region. And then the Clean Ohio Re Revitalization Fund, which specifically could be applied to the pellet terminal site, um, which may need further brownfield re remediation. That's it. Now the Community Benefits Agreement. So um, in addition to all the traditional funding we've been showing you, we'd also like to propose a more new way of develop and fund big large scale developments like from Lorraine City, this is a big development. How does this work? A private public partnership usually has a private developer here and the governmental sector over here. A community benefits agreement emphasizes putting the community at the negotiation table and we identified Main Street Lorraine as one of those community coalitions. This would help uh, building a healthy relationship with the community in the future, and it puts them eye to eye with everybody else to the negotiating table. When we are talking about all these site development plans, we also would like to see affordable housing, local and hiring, uh, local hiring and living wages. We'd like to see community infrastructures like the public parks. And we would also like to see local job force training while this whole thing happens. And the art of community benefits agreements is to not scare away a private developer, but to make people feel involved and to have people have their voices heard and come to a common agreement. All righty. And so we thank you for your time and in, uh, enjoying this presentation. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, before we close, we'd like to just uh, acknowledge all of our stakeholders. Uh, we'd like to thank our client, the city of Lorraine, for giving us the opportunity to explore this. Uh, and this is how we plan to balance Broadway.